All right. So we are in Unit 2 of God's Economics. Unit 2 is Biblical Pictures of Provision, Part 2, From Slavery to Kingdom. And we just covered Egyptian slavery for the Israelites, but now God has redeemed them out of Egyptian slavery. And we're going into point B, which is wilderness. The wilderness is about gathering, it's about obedience, and it's about the fear of the Lord. So God led Israel out of Egypt uh, and into the wilderness, the wilderness of Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula. There is no natural water. There is no natural food. Okay, I have been to Sinai. If you have been there, it's amazing. We we were driving across from Israel to Egypt, and then, of course, the other way back from Egypt back into Israel. And to be there in person, it is a barren wasteland. There is nothing there. It's just high hills, mountainous, rough terrain, challenging terrain. There is no food there. And it just brought it home for me how completely impossible, completely impossible it was that for God to have provided for his people for 40 years in this wilderness. It's impossible, but God did it because God is just that good. And he is the all-powerful one, the maker of heaven and earth. And he chose his people. He's not going to let them just starve in the wilderness. He knows how to provide. He can provide in supernatural ways in addition to natural ways. And he also, it's worth noting, that uh, he didn't leave them to go and scavenge scavenge for their own provision. They didn't have to go out hunting for their own provision and, and hope that they could find something and then praise God, even though they were doing it all themselves and trying to find some goat. I mean, I'm telling you, there are some nomads that live in, on the Sinai Peninsula even today. But let me tell you something. They're skinny. Okay, and even their goats are skinny. I'm not making this up. It's for real. There is nothing there. And so Israel, God was with them. He led them by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. God was with them. And where God is, there is always provision. Where God is, there is always enough according to his plan, according to his purpose, according to his promise of provision and blessing. And it's also worth noting, before we get into the wilderness, that um, God, okay, there the wilderness, it gives us 40 years of examples of Israel. There's a lot of grumbling. Rah, we don't like being in this wilderness. We want to be in the promised land. This is not what we were expecting. There's a lot of instances of rebellion. You know, they don't want to be there anymore, or they want to be in charge, or they want things to be their own way. But even in instances, of rebellion against God. Even, even at the golden calf, God did not withhold food and water from his people. Take note of that. Even when his people kind of unilaterally across the board started worshiping a calf, a golden idol made into the shape of a calf and saying, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt and dancing around and worshiping it. Even at that, God, he dealt with in different instances of rebellion against him. God did punish specific offenders. He punished specific offenders with plague, with death, with defeat, with exclusion from the promised land. So there's a whole generation of people that come into the wilderness, but they die in the wilderness. They are excluded from the promised land. But even in that, he did not withhold food 
and water from his people. Just pause on that for a moment. And I, I want to mention quickly, this is just a quick note about, um, I know I said something in the context of not selling out like Esau and training our bodies through fasting. Um, I want to make it clear, God, as I said in the introduction, asked me many years ago to give away everything I own and live by faith. So I have been living that way, not asking anyone for anything that I need, just trusting God in prayer and obeying his voice. But I want to be clear, because I, I have said this many times in different places, but God has never, never, never let me go without. No matter where in the world he has sent me, God has never let me go without. He has always faithfully provided for me. And I say this so passionately because I've heard ministries talk about, well, we we were fasting because we didn't have food. No, no, no. That's not fasting. That's starving. If if there's no food, then there's a problem somewhere in the works. Either either you're you're not in faith that you think you are, or there's some attack of the evil one against you that you're not resisting properly. If there's not food, it's that's not called fasting. Okay, that that's a problem, and you've got to press into the spirit and discover what the problem is. When God, when you are in the will of God, there is always provision. God proves that again and again and again and again. The fasting is about training our bodies, and the context in which I said that was not to sell out like Esau. Now, I will say this. There have been times in the nations, whether I was hosted by someone or whether God had sent me out on a mission where I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, or where we're going out to various places and we don't eat until nine o'clock at night. So we're going all day in the hot African sun and we don't eat until, you know, nine o'clock at night. Well, if you haven't trained your body through fasting to understand that you don't need to eat at breakfast time, at lunch time, at snack time, at dinner time. You know, if you've trained your body that you're not obeying your body, but that you are obeying the Spirit of the Lord, then God can send you anywhere, and you're not going to collapse because your your mind has not been disciplined to understand how to walk with God until God provides the way that only He can. So just a quick note about that, but I also just wanted to highlight, but as we get into the wilderness, looking at the wilderness, and God's provision in the wilderness, that God, even when Israel messed up, even in some big time ways, God did not withhold food and water. We have to understand the character of God. And so, there will be some times in this uh, this element of the wilderness and looking at God's provision through the wilderness, I'll refer to things as wilderness training. So you might be in a season with the Lord right now where you believe that God has called you into a wilderness, where supply seems to dry up, where you are called to be set apart from the common way of doing things, where you've been redeemed or extracted out of an existence like the one that is in this world or doing things the world's way, but you also know that you are not in the promised land yet. Well, that, my friends, is an extremely valuable and precious holy place to be. Don't fight it. Don't try to rush your wilderness season. Don't try to kick and pout and fuss your way out of it. And don't start reading all these silly books with all their prayer techniques of how to pray your way out of the wilderness. No, God wants to teach you about himself and his ways through this season of wilderness. So you know what you need to do to it? Shut your mouth and submit. Submit to it. Submit to the Lord. Submit to the Lord. Receive it with joy. Be attentive. Meditate on the word day and night. Stop the grumbling. Stop the self-pity. Meditate on the word of God and extract everything that the Spirit of the Lord wants to give you of how God trains his people 
the, the, the training that we receive in the wilderness is what prepares us to handle the promised land correctly. If you don't learn your lessons in the wilderness, then you're going to handle the promised land incorrectly, and you don't want that. It's a blowout for you, and it's not a good representation of God. Okay, so that was 10 minutes, sorry, of some introductions of where we're going with some of these pictures pictures of the wilderness. All right, so Israel has come out of Egyptian slavery, and they have now come three days, three whole days into their wilderness journey. And this is where God is going to miraculously make water clean for them in the midst of a desert wasteland. Okay, so let's look at the scripture. It's in your study guide, Exodus 15, starting with verse 23. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water at Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah or Merah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he, Moses, cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Okay, so they're they're like, what are we going to drink? We're thirsting to death. Moses cries out to the Lord. God gives Moses a supernatural, miraculous way. The water is bitter. It's poisonous. It's going to kill you if you drink it. And usually, I mean, if you're just walking by a a putrid stink fest pond, you can't just pick up a stick and throw the stick in the water and all of a sudden the water is purified and drinkable. Okay, but when God tells you to do it and God says, if you do this act of obedience, then I will make the water drinkable, that's what's going on here. So Moses, he had to exercise his faith. He had to obey what God told him to do. He had to believe that if he picked up that stick and threw it in the water, the water would be made drinkable. So this is also, notice, God is taking something bitter and making it sweet. God is taking them out of bitter slavery, and he's taking them into the sweetness, land of milk and honey, of the promised land. So this is the journey that they're on. Don't miss the little hints and clues that we have of this is a picture. This is a picture of God's ability to provide supernaturally in even the most impossible impossible circumstances. This is a picture also of the purpose of the wilderness. The purpose of the wilderness is to train us in understanding God's ability and God's willingness to provide everything that we need through whatever means necessary. God has all sorts of ways, and he is all-powerful, and he is all-sovereign. But it's also, he's saying, you've got to obey me. You've got to do things my way. And at this point, it's interesting to note that the law has not yet been given. Actually, God hasn't even given them a rule or a statute or a command. He's saying, if you obey my rules and statutes and commands, but right now he's just speaking to them by his voice, and they haven't gotten. The Ten Commandments are still several chapters after this. He hasn't given his commands yet. What he desires, what God has always desired from his people— The law was never God's design, was never God's design. We also get into that extensively in the gospel is the power. The law was never God's design. 
God always wanted his people to obey his voice. And there's a reference on that. You can look at Jeremiah 7 in your own time. But the wilderness is about, okay, obey my voice. If you do things my way, your water will always be sweet. Your body will always be sweet. There'll be no sickness in your body. None of the diseases that I put on Egypt will be on you, for I am your healer. And then from there, so they're they're drinking at Mara, Mara, however you want to say that. Um, they're drinking the water there, and then God moved them on to another place. God knew, because uh, God knows everything, there was a natural spring, a natural oasis called Elim, and there were 70 palm trees, 12 springs of water, which is a picture of supernatural abundance, even in the midst of this wilderness. Now, this is also, I said supernatural, but it's also natural. It is a freak occurrence in the wilderness that such a place would exist, but this was natural looking provision. This is different from throwing a stick in putrid water and making it clean. This is actually clean water, 12 springs of clean water and 70 palm trees in a, in a natural place. And so God knows as he leads Israel or as he leads us, he knows where the pockets of provision are. He knows that we've got to learn how to follow his guidance. We've got to learn just like Israel. This is the picture. We're extracting some information out of this. We've got to learn how to obey God's voice, just like it was God's will for Israel. Okay, so Israel gets one month into their wilderness journey, and this is when the manna from heaven begins. Now, manna from heaven is one of the critical factors from learning about Israel's experience in the wilderness and how we will be trained by God through a wilderness experience to learn to trust God for daily provision. The wilderness training of the manna from heaven example is a test of our faith. It's a test of obedience. It's a test of whether we're willing to rest and trust in God or not. And it is the Father disciplining us. Now, I don't use discipline in a bad way. Discipline or chastisement to me is has always been a good thing. The Father is disciplining us as his children. He's disciplining Israel as his people, as his nation, to obey his voice. So those of you who know me know that I was trained as a classical ballerina. And so for me, discipline is what makes you better. Discipline is what makes you stronger. Discipline is what makes you into an expert. You know, those who are undisciplined, they are lazy, they are slack, they are missing opportunities, they are not doing everything that could be done to be the best that they can be in whatever it is that they are called to do. So to me, discipline is not a bad thing. And the book of Hebrews also makes that clear. God is disciplining us. He's chastising us as sons. Why? Because he's conforming us to the image of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that we might be like him. He's training us in his ways through his chastisement, through his discipline. So let's look at, at manna from heaven with that lens, a positive lens on it, and how man, the Israelites demonstrate this for us. So let's go into the back. Background. This is in Exodus 16 now, uh, and starting with verse 2. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So there's a whole lot of grumbling going on in the wilderness, okay? And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. All right, so pause there. I, you know, I just love this. I laugh. And you know, you can laugh at the Israelites, but if you've ever been through wilderness training, 
stop lying. You've been just like them. You've been a grumbler too, okay? I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying it's a reality. We don't want to be grumblers, and we don't want to have accusations against God's character that he brought us into this place to kill us, that he has evil intent towards us. That's not the heart of God at all. But also, the Israelites, they're here saying, you know, we had it so good in Egypt. We had meat you know, pots full of meat and bread as much as we wanted. Yeah, okay, except, hello, you were a slave. Uh, case closed. You, like, let's not forget, all right, you had a meat pot because you were working as a slave to build cities for the man. Like, come on, people, let's get your head wrapped around this. It wasn't just free meat. You were given your whole life over just to have that meat. So, you know, the complaining, the grumbling, let's get some perspective on this. So verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I might test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So yes, I know we've advanced from Exodus 15 to 16. God has still not given the law. But God is testing them to see if they will obey his voice. When he gives a command, when the creator of the universe gives a command, it's as good as law. But God has not given the Ten Commandments yet, and he has not given the rest of the law yet. The manna, he's going to rain down bread for them, and that's going to be the test of whether they will obey or not. So, God is going to supply miraculous food to see how his people respond to that. So moving on, we're going to start, pick up at Exodus 16 and verse 14. So, and when the dew had gone up, this is the first morning that the manna has come from heaven, that God has supplied this miracle bread. There was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So God, again, just like with the water, he has proven that in the middle of nowhere, in the most impossible situation, God is able to supply bread out of nowhere. It appears. It rains down from heaven. Why? Because he's God. Why? Because he's good. Why? Because God knows how to supply the needs of his people. And remember, this is 600,000 men over the age of 20, not including women and children. This is possibly up to 2 million people. Bread every day for 2 million people. God is awesome. Wow. All right, so let's keep going. This is Exodus 16. We're up to verse 16. This is what the Lord God has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. That sounds like an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's just that the only thing on the buffet menu is manna, okay? But it's all you can eat, man. So you shall eat and take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. So everybody gets an omer. An omer is about the equivalent of two quarts or two liters. So it's a generous portion of bread for the day for each person. And the uh, so this is verse 17. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more. More and some less. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit, how that is part of the wilderness training also. So we'll jump to verse 19. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, 
it melted. Okay, so wilderness training is about learning to trust God for new manna every morning. It takes faith. It takes trust to eat today's provision when you don't know where tomorrow's provision is going to come from. And this invisible God who you've never seen and you, you're you like, I think he's there, but maybe I've lost my mind. You know, is this invisible God going to really provide because... If I don't eat, I'm going to die. So is God going to be faithful or or is he going to just leave me to die in this wilderness? And this is where the thoughts start to come. You know what? I was better off in Egypt, even if they consider, yeah, I was a slave there, but at least I had meat. You know, it can be scary to eat today's manna and trust that God will provide new manna tomorrow. But it's learning. That's what it is. It's learning to trust God and to trust that even in the middle of a cursed land, a dry and a weary land where there is no water, where there is no bread, where there is no provision, that the people are not cursed, but are blessed by God and that God is able and willing to provide. Wilderness training is about learning to gather, gather gather. Okay, so in Eden, what did they do? Eden, you walk around, you want some fruit, you want a pear, you want an apple, you want an orange. All you got to do, walk up to a tree, pluck it off, boom, done, meal for the day. Woohoo, right? So that is a different picture than the curse. We get into sweat and toil and thorns and thistles. And then in slavery, there's hard labor and oppression by harsh and brutal taskmasters, okay? Wilderness training is like, let's get all that cursed mentality out of you. That's not your existence anymore. Now, you might not have every tree of the garden to walk up to and pluck off the fruit that you want, but wilderness training is about learning to gather. Every day you go out, there's no sweat, There's no toil. There's no thorns. There's no thistles. There's no slave master. There's no harsh taskmaster. You just go out, you gather up what God has provided, and you bring it back, and you've got your food for the day. This is going to be really important when we transition into the promised land. Everybody had as much as they needed. And we talked about how it takes faith because the natural human instinct, and I talk to plenty of people who do have revelation of the end times, but they have become hoarders. So the natural human instinct of survival would compel you. If you are, if you are without God in this world, then, you know, people are hoarding their resources to try to save up, to protect themselves. People have bought this like space food that is going to last for 25 years or whatever. But here's what's so sad about that. I know people, more more than one group of people, they bought space food that lasts 25 years. But you know what? It was like 23 years ago. So guess what? All of this food, they thought the end of the world was coming. It didn't come. And so all of the food that they saved up and hoarded for this day that they thought was coming is all now either going to have to be eaten in a short period of time or it's going to go to waste. Hoarding is not the way of faith. Hoarding is faith in your own stuff, faith in your own ability to hoard your stuff. Who demonstrated that idea? Well, the first one, his name was Cain. The second one that exhibits it in living color, his name was Nimrod. Do you want to be like them or do you want to be like the people of God? It's not about hoarding your stuff and building up your security so that you've got your continued sustenance. Wilderness training is about learning to trust God, which includes learning to consume what you have, trusting that God will provide more. More. I know as God has walked me through the wilderness training, I had to learn. This is an expression I tell people all the time. I am not afraid of zero. 
I am not afraid of zero. If I am in the will of God, if God has told me to spend my last dime, and oftentimes God doesn't just tell you to spend your last dime, he tells you to give your last dime to somebody else who needs it more than you do, and sometimes someone that doesn't need it more than you do. But as an act of obedience, if you're in the will of God, you don't have to be afraid of zero. I've already said this seven, several times. Zero plus Jesus equals everything. Don't be afraid of zero. Don't be afraid of consuming today's manna because God is able, abundantly able to provide everything that you need according to his plan for your life. So let's keep going. We're still on manna from heaven. Exodus 16, we're up to verse 22. On the sixth day, sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So we just learn on regular days, if you keep anything until the morning, it's going to get worms and stink. It's going to rot and fester. But now it's a new command on this particular day. So God, he doesn't do things the same way all the time. We've got to be attentive. He can say, this time I want you to do it this way. And then this time I want you to do it that way. So we've got to be attentive and stay in step with what God is instructing. So now he's saying, keep it until the morning. So we're at verse 24. They laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. And Moses said, eat today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. They didn't even have to go out and gather on the Sabbath. They got a full day of rest. No sweat, no toil, no thorns, no thistles, no slave masters, no gathering. Even that today is a Sabbath rest unto the Lord. Today, you will not find any in the field. It's just not even going to be there. God's not going to tempt you by laying out tomorrow's manna today, and then you'll be tempted to go get it on the day when you should be resting. No, it's not even going to be there. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, however, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. So what God said, God did. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So we touched on this. The rest, the Sabbath rest, was the test of obedience. God had not given any other command yet. This was the first command that God gave to his people that had just been redeemed from slavery. The first command God gave to them was rest, and they didn't obey. On the seventh day, they went out. Now, this wasn't the whole of them. This was just some of them. They went out to try to gather on the seventh day, and they didn't find any. But God saw that they had done it, and he realized that they were unable to keep his commandments and his laws. They had only received one commandment, only one. That's it. This is all God has asked of them so far. Six days gather, one day rest. They weren't able to do it. In a cursed existence, there are no days of rest, but they were supposed to have a day of rest. In slavery, there are no days of rest, but they were supposed to have a day of rest. God was testing their hearts, and their hearts of faith would be demonstrated by their obedience. Okay, so God, I hope you're getting it. He gives rest as a gift to his people. This is another part of wilderness training. It's about to learn to trust, learning to trust God. That God, even as you rest, that God is working. And I call it rest as an act of faith. That's how I had to engage with it. I was the ultimate type A, control freak, workaholic, okay? So for God to tell me to rest, I had to talk to myself about, I had to convince myself, okay, 
This to rest is a verb. To rest is to do something. And to do something, this is what God wants me to do. So I'm going to do this as an act of faith. And so I I created the phrase, it is rest as an act of faith. So that is how I had to approach rest in my early years of the wilderness training. I'm going to rest as an act of faith that God is working on my behalf and that God God will not fail me. Even if I do not sweat and toil and slave for it, God will not fail me because he has commanded me to rest as an act of faith. And so that's part of what wilderness training is about. And again, this is just reiterating this as we wrap this up, but manna from heaven. Okay, we talked about this. The people of Israel ate manna for 40 years. Whoa, about 2 million people, definitely over 1 million, 600,000 men plus women and children, plus people under 20 years old that hadn't been counted, probably about 2 million people for every single day for 40 years. Come on, you think God can't give you breakfast? You think God can't send you an egg or a potato? 40 years, 2 million people every day. God is able. God is able, but he's testing the hearts of his people to see if they trust him and will obey him. 